What you do is who you are. People think what they believe is who they are. What you actually do with it is what matters. You do have to do something afterwards. It can't just be listening to podcasts and watching YouTube videos. Then you are floating disembodied in that philosophy world, which is intangible. I'm sure Mark Cuban could use a life hack. The rest of us are pretty bad at life. We don't need life hacks. We probably need to step back and stop living like idiots. When somebody else writes your obituary, they can say that you were a poet. They can say that you made some short films, but it'll be something that you've actually done. It's all this series of little tiny moments where you're taking the garbage out, you're brushing your teeth, you're showing up on time. All of these are little junctures where it's like, well, who am I? If who I am is what I'm doing, then what do I do right now to be that person? Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU's day. We are here live on Discord because it is 6 p.m. Eastern. We're always here live on Discord every single Tuesday. I am Kevin Lieber, and with me as always is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, and I was uh, I was going over the last few weeks because today we spent some time planning out the rest of the year. This is about the time when you do that. You know, the middle of November is when you, you get the, the last 10% uh, kind of in front of you and start to... Uh, move things around and get a sense of it. And I, I'm struggling at this point. I, I'm honestly struggling with what to say about main gear because it's be, it's beginning to sound not real. Um, the the productivity that I've had over the last few weeks has been remarkable, considering all the things in life that are conspiring to keep me unproductive. Uh, I, I I didn't lose any ground during. A month long, well, six week long time when I absolutely should have been driven into the ground, not just lost it. Uh, and things are pretty good with our pace. Uh, it is massively, massively due uh, to this this setup that I've got. It is efficient. It's fast. I work faster. Um, I didn't really think that something like that could make a difference because I'm pretty good at the stuff that I do at this point. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, you know, I, I thought I just needed something not awful. I didn't think that uh, the gains from a really good setup would be significant. I thought they'd be like, you know, a 2% boost. At a point, you're really like clawing uh, percentage point by percentage point. I, th- I thought I was there. No, 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 no. Uh, this thing pops. It's made the podcast uh, much, much easier. I just push a couple buttons and I'm ready to roll. Like this has been absolutely masterful. So I, I know they make computers for people who do a lot of high end gaming and and they want performance in that arena. Um, yeah, I, that that's not me at all. That's not me at all. And it has made my work life <laughs> twice as productive, which I, I never should have admitted because now you'll expect more out of me. And that sucks. I've just talked myself into twice the labor. Uh, but yeah, I, I absolutely, uh, believe that that is a major, major part of smooth sailing for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, having good tools matters. So regardless of what sort of tools you need to do your work, having good ones, uh, really helps. Yeah. We have a, uh, a new Vsauce 2 video came out yesterday. We have another one coming out next week. We have another one coming out a couple of weeks after that, or a week after that, two weeks, just, two weeks just after, after that? Thanksgiving. Yeah, two weeks after that. Not even. I think. Yeah, like the thirtieth. I think it's a blur. It's a blur, but uh, we are getting a lot of good, great work done, and uh, we are doing something new with this podcast that I'm really excited about. So a couple of weeks ago, I debuted uh, my rule for life number one. Uh, tonight, Matt will debut his rule for life number one. But before we get to Matt's rule for life, I had. A second example. You have an update, don't you? What's that? You have an update. You have a rule update. I have a rule update because you know what? Uh, when I when I spoke my rule a couple of weeks ago, which was that people often get mad about things that they're completely wrong about. That that was my rule. It's really just an observation of life, more so than a rule of, of life. Something to to be aware of and to notice. A little bit of a pattern of human behavior is that people will be really upset about things that they're just like stupid about. 
Um, the example that I gave had to do with with blockbuster video driving mom and pop stores out of business when the fact <laughs> right. is yeah. blockbuster also went out of business. That whole industry is gone. So like, what does it matter? Um, I thought of another one afterwards that I also thought was really funny and I thought you would think was funny. And it was a person railing against raking. The the process of raking okay. leaves was really angry that people... What is their gripe? <laughs> they were so mad about people raking. And I'm not quite sure whether they they had like a raking injury as a kid and they're still upset about it <laughs> or if this was some environmentalism thing in which they were angry that like gas powered leaf blowers were ruining the earth i don't remember exactly what the like crux of the like fomenting anger was but what i do remember was their opinion that everyone who rakes is an idiot the the whole process of raking is stupid. It's a stupid process done by stupid people because leaves <sighs> biodegrade. So you don't need okay. you don't need to rake the leaves because they'll just naturally break down anyway. <laughs> and, and I knew okay. <laughs> which I just lost my mind over that oh and needed God. to break that bring this up to you because I knew you would hate it. <laughs> okay, that is that is so <laughs> stupid on so many levels. Like, first of all, the reason people hate raking is because it is massively <laughs> triceps in intensive. You're pulling the rake is essentially a triceps activity. And that is the thing that you use the least in everyday life in terms of like all the, the body muscles. You just and don't your lats. the hell out of your triceps. triceps yeah, yeah. You, you don't do much with those two elements in everyday life. So when raking comes around. It beats the hell out of you. It's really tough to do. It's awkward and you're not very good at it. And you're, you feel very sore after everybody hates raking, but yeah, it doesn't work that way. I mean, <laughs> if, and, and Ben, Ben knows this because I called Ben a couple of years ago in an emergency state. I had to get the leaves off my lawn before the first snow because it will kill all the grass underneath them. Yes, correct. Now, yeah, they're biodegradable. But over the course of years, <laughs> they don't degrade before the next year's leaves are on top of them. They have to be in very, very tiny, tiny, tiny pieces to break down like that. That's the whole point of leaves in terms of nature is to suppress the growth of competitors underneath the tree. Yeah. Like, yes. Oh. It kills all the grass. That's why that's why you rake It's because it completely kills the grass. That was the first thing I thought of. I was like. Everything. It have you ever, this person, there's no way this person either has lived in a city their whole life or lived in like a desert area their whole life. There's no way they've yeah. ever been to a forest because you know what? There's not a whole lot of on for it in the forest grass. There's, there's no yeah, lawn not, on, in the forest. It, it's all, no, it, no it's there's like a reason why grass isn't. Yeah. It's not like knee high the way an open field is in you know, in August, it, nothing grows there. Even even if it's needles from from conifers and pines, it, it's just something is going to cover it. So there's not a whole lot growing other than like really aggressive, um, uh, like weed, some shrubs, kind of weeds, you know, brush. Yeah, yeah. Some things do grow uh, under most trees, but yeah, like like moss is a good example. Like think about what moss is. Moss is like a soft scab on a thing and that's the best nature can do under trees is be like oh let's find something that can be slimy and and weird and it can <laughs> live by harnessing the slightest bit of light that happens to make it through these trees and then it, we'll, we'll put it on a rock like glue and then just kind of see what happens that's the best that nature can do because leaves and pine needles are so destructive to Oh God! Well, they create yeah, it, it so creates they, they incredibly did. fertile fertile ground. Oh yeah, of course. So yeah, like it awesome. creates like beautiful sort of topsoil mulch or whatever. But yeah, the point of raking yeah, is over fifty years because it murders your lawn. That's why people rake. They don't just do it for fun. They don't just do it because no. it's not fun. It sucks. No one likes it. It was so funny to me. No. And not only the other thing I, uh, is that uh, ticks love living in leaves. So like if you have a dog. Mm. 
that you let out. Mm -hmm. You don't want it traipsing through leaves because it's just like a tick fest. As another reason to rake leaves. So immediately I thought like, okay, you know what? Like another rule might, or maybe like a, an addendum to my first rule is like, perhaps if you think a thing that everybody else, uh, that everybody else does is stupid and you're the only oh. person who has like figured out <laughs> <laughs> that it's stupid, you might want to consider that you don't understand that thing and you might be the stupid one. There's a high yeah, there's probability there's probably something there. you don't get. <laughs> there's probably there's something, something you're you missing. don't understand about this process that everyone else is doing. No one likes doing, but they do for some mysterious reason. But yeah, they're yeah. they're the dumb ones. Good congratulations. You figured it out. Genius. Oh, oh man. So that that was my well, that was my take too on uh people being angry over just things that they're completely dumb about. Uh, another example of that. I thought it was a good one, but it's it's upsetting. Now I can't do my rule because I'm so upset. I, I know you would like I'm this, so affected, especially <laughs> after like weeks of dealing with leaves yeah. horribly. But yeah, this is the first time in eight years that I have dealt with the problem adequately before the snow. Mm. It's the first time I've conquered it. And that happened also. That also happened during this time period when I had a million things going on that were awful. That happened too. So for the first time in eight years, not only did I not get behind on work, but I got at pace, like the real proper homeowner's pace uh, with with critical outdoor things. Absolutely remarkable. Thank you, Main Gear. Uh, now, Main Gear needs to build a, a better leaf processing machine. That's a, that's when I'll get the Main Gear tattoo on my chest. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, I like the corollary to that, to that rule. Um, I'm going to preface my rule, though. I, I want to say something before I, I drop the rule because it's a really simple one. It's really short. And that means it's susceptible to that uh, that bell curve meme, you know, where the idiots on the left, like the Frankenstein is the monster meme. You know, the one I mean, yeah. where the, the low end of the bell curve says Frankenstein is the monster. The the high point in the middle is Frankenstein's not the monster, actually, you know, and then uh, the very top of the the curve is actually Frankenstein is the monster. Um, that's what happens with with my rule here. And if you think this rule is simple, you are one of those midwits. You are in the center who you do not get it. If you think this rule is very good, you think it's a genius rule, I cannot guarantee that you're on the high end of the curve. You may well be so hopelessly idiotic that you're on the other side, but it does mean that you'll at least be getting the right conclusion. So that's fine. Yeah. But it's deceptively simple. And this is the rule. What you do is who you are, period. That is it. You are what you do. Okay. And that is filled with a lot of tiny, clear words, but the, the interpretation of those words matters. Okay. Um, there are some, some, little add-ons to this rule, uh, like what you don't do is who you are. For example, I am, I am not somebody, uh, who, who snorts cocaine. I don't do cocaine. No, well, that's, uh, you know, that's part of who I am. There are all sorts of things that I don't do that, that make up who I am. So it does work both ways. Um, the problem here is that people think that what they believe and what they think and feel is who they are. It's not. What you believe about the world, or really anything, is not too relevant. It just, it just kind of isn't. What you actually do with it is what matters. Uh, there's some limits on this, too. Uh, you, have, you have to qualify some things. Like, the results of what you do are almost never who you are. So, think of this in terms of this podcast and the people we talk to. Um, Schlatt said that he made videos that nobody watched for a long time, and uh, then he blew up. He was the same person at the beginning of that process as he was at the end of that process. The results changed dramatically, but he didn't change. He was the same person. Pebbles is the same guy before he had a show uh, that was massively successful on, on network TV. Um, Glozell is another great one. Because she experienced a serious fall after YouTube yanked the rug out from under her. She was exactly the same person after that point as she was at the absolute peak. 
you can't think you can't think about the results of what you do so much. Um, but now I want to go into with you, Kevin, I want to go into what what each of these things mean. So when I say what you do is who you are and the results of what you do are not who you are. That means almost everything comes down to a really simple kind of question that you can, that you can ask yourself. Um, Kevin, you are somebody who makes YouTube videos. You are, that means that, um, you can say you're not somebody who just thinks about making YouTube videos. It means two things. Everything that you do means two things. Uh, I took a shower before this podcast. I did a little bit of stuff today and uh, I turned the camera on. It's not like it really matters how I look, uh, but at the same time, yeah, I don't want to look awful. That means I am someone who uh, took care of myself to a basic degree before this podcast. It means I am not somebody who showed up not having showered in a week and not caring. Everything that you do, everything that you don't do is indicative of the other side too. And I, I think those two concepts are really where, where we need to start today. Uh, well, with the third one, too, that is simply believing a thing. Simply believing a thing is not doing anything. It's like Dave Chappelle saying that Twitter isn't real life. Twitter isn't real life because nothing of substance actually occurs there. It's really just just people talking. Very rarely uh, does something happen there that spills over into real life does for individuals. Occasionally we're seeing people get fired by Elon Musk, uh, every few hours because of their tweets. Uh, but generally it's a bunch of people talking about what they believe and uh, that they think other people are wrong about things. Um, that's not real. And that's not who you are. It's, this runs counter to almost everything that, that people try to foster in you when you're young. That's like, dream big, uh, set all these goals, stuff like that. It doesn't work that way. You aren't your dreams. You are what you did today. You're what you're doing right now. You're what uh, you're going to do tomorrow. And it is a succession of all the things you do and don't do. That's it. And you may do something that has an impact on the entire world. You may uh, be in the top, you know, 0.001% of your chosen hobby or profession or uh, physique or whatever you you put your time into. Maybe not, though. Maybe not. Um, but that's the result stuff that doesn't actually doesn't actually reflect who you are. If you're a bodybuilder who's like top 10 in Mr. Universe, that's that's amazing in terms of uh, the percentage in your field. But that's not who you are. You are somebody who trains very hard, has a, a, a total commitment to this thing in terms of their lifestyle, their diet, probably who they hang around with, who they're in relationships with. Everything in their life caters to this one goal. That's who they are. It's not that they finished ninth in a competition. That's a detail. That's the kind of thing that's on a Wikipedia page, but that's not who they are. So when you think about everything in terms of what you do is who you are, then your perspective changes on everything. Yeah, I think that this idea is really important sort of now more than ever because we, be, be, just because of the nature of the internet, I think that we are so used to, I mean, let's be honest and be self-aware of what we're doing right now, which is a whole lot of mm -hmm. sort of philosophizing and talking and sharing ideas. And that is really good to do. I think that's really helpful to do. I think it's really powerful to do that um, because you can have conversations and, and express ideas um, across tremendous distances to people who, you know, maybe will benefit from the discussion, maybe will benefit from your rule or, 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 and, and change something about themselves that is for the betterment of them, them, their lives and, and those around them. Mm -hmm. But, but <laughs> this is a, a capital B, but, you do have to do something afterwards. You do have to do, it can't just be all day listening to podcasts and watching YouTube videos and, and, and talking no. to people. It cannot be that all day because you're right. Then you are sort of floating like disembodied in that 
like philosophy world, which is intangible. Yeah. And you're living in your own head at that point. You're living in your own head. Yeah. Or you're living in other people's heads, like vicariously <laughs> living in other people's heads. Yeah, which is its own problem. Sure. Which is also a problem. And and at some point, like you got to turn that off. You got to turn off the 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 headspace and get into your hand space. You got to get into doing something mm. physically and return to reality almost. And And yeah, and figure out. What it is you do because because person who listens to podcasts or person who just consumes stuff, is that is that who you are? And if it is, is that who you want to be? Hopefully no heat in November is going as well for you as it is for me. I like gambling on how deep I can go into the winter before I have to turn my heat on. There's snow on the ground right now, but I think I can stretch it to Thanksgiving this year. That kind of gambling is fun. Gambling on the people you hire? No, that's wrong. You don't need to do it, though. You can make efficient, informed hires with LinkedIn Jobs. It is ridiculously easy. You make a job posting, you add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to show that you're hiring, and then you add a few screening questions to filter down to exactly the right candidates. Then you're ready to interview. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to and faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash create. That's linkedin.com slash create to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. There is nothing more expensive than trying to save money on hiring. You've got to choose exactly the right people the first time around. LinkedIn Jobs is giving you a shot to do that for free. Take the opportunity. LinkedIn.com slash create. You know, if if that is somebody I and they're happy with it, I am totally happy for them. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to do anything grand. You don't owe the world anything amazing. Mm-hmm. You you can do what makes you happy. And that may be. Uh, yes, I I play video games. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy. You know, it's like um, I'm not going to lobby for you to win a Nobel Prize of any kind. But, uh, hey, you're doing your thing. There's no problem there. But let's be honest about what you're doing and what you're not doing. You are not really in a position to know much about anything if all you do is play video games or listen to podcasts or watch YouTube. Um, You can know a lot about the video games that you play. Yeah. Yeah, you could. You could. And if that's in your own head, then uh, you're really cultivating a, a... collection in your own mind and then not letting anybody see it. You know, it's like creating a museum and then just bolting the door shut forever. Like I'm going to do with my house. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Which is a half joke. Which is, yeah, it's like 50, 51% true. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you have to be honest about, about what, what that really means for who you are. And if somebody says, I am somebody who eats pizza and plays video games, I'm like, well, okay, I don't want to be that person, but I'm, I'm glad you're having a good time. Uh, but I don't think too many people are honest about, about the limits when they, they choose that kind of life. Um, but the, one of the most valuable things with thinking about this topic and why I think it's directly relevant to everybody who listens to this show is in the artistic community, there's... For, for lack of a more specific phrase, a lot of depression, right? Uh, strains of depression, not necessarily clinical, but man, do artists get out of whack. They get down. They're affected by things. Creators are affected by things more strongly than the average person. Uh, I don't think that every single person uh, struggles with depression. A lot do. Uh, but I think they're susceptible to depression-like elements. And there are times when you just can't do stuff. You can't do the things you need to do or the things that you want to do. And I I think it's tremendously helpful to think about this, what I do is who I am thing. So let's say it's a day where like you don't want to get out of bed in the morning and you feel like you can't. You've got two options. You can be like, imagine somebody in the room watching you writing like Uh, writing down everything about your day. Are they going to write, this is a person who dresses themselves and brushes their teeth? Or uh, are you a person, would you say to somebody, I am am the sort of person who does not dress themselves and who does not brush their teeth? That's probably not you. You don't think of yourself as somebody who does not get out of bed and brush their teeth. 
Well, okay, if that's not you, then then do that thing. You know, if then you've got a reason to do that little thing, and it's not a, a giant task. It doesn't have consequences on the world, but it's important. It's an important part of uh, of going through your day and and kind of living your life, right? All these little things, and you're constantly asking yourself, "Am I somebody who does X, or am I somebody who does Y?" And you'll usually find that one of those options is somebody you don't want to be. So maybe you can't bring yourself to get out of bed and brush your teeth because just the world is crumbling around you and you hate life. But maybe, maybe you really don't want to be that person in option Y. Uh, This kind of thing, and it's not like you're shaming yourself into action, uh, but you look at the two alternatives and you don't want to be that person. You wouldn't want somebody to say, this is who I am. Uh, that's a really powerful motivator and gives you a purpose for doing even simple things in your life. Uh, that's, that is really important because it is hard to have reasons for anything you do. Um, uh, all this stuff about, I, I hate the phrase life hacks, like seven people in the world need life hacks. Like I'm sure Mark <laughs> Cuban could use a life hack. Okay, because he doesn't have any substantial things he needs to work on. The rest of us are are pretty bad at life. We don't need life hacks. We don't need that one neat little trick that's going to solve a major problem. We probably need to step back and stop living like idiots. And I say this as, you know, like I've talked a little bit about this on the podcast. Maybe, maybe not actually, but a lot in the Discord server, I... I uh, have gotten myself in physical shape in the last six months and in a, in a broader sense over the last two years. It's not like I'm uh, uh, a ripped Adonis. It's not that. I'm just not a disaster like I was. And that's good. I, I'm comfortable with with that kind of thing. And along the way, yeah, Jeff uh, in the episode chat says on the way to better shape, base weight was just talking about slimming down. I'm like, every, uh, everybody is making progress here, it seems. It's awesome. And all of us have had this this moment where it's like, am I this person or am I that person? And am I willing to do what I need to do to be the one I want to be? Sometimes you don't because you're just not into it or it's too hard. Uh if, if it's like, am I a person who uh, can run a marathon? No, I'm going to choose I am the person who cannot run a marathon because I don't want to. I have no interest in training for long distance running. I, I don't even want to run a 5K. I don't care. And I'm also comfortable with not caring. If somebody looks at my life and says, this is someone who cannot run a 5K, like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say, yeah, y- you I'll are correct. <laughs> Yeah, I can't speak Swahili either. I'm not upset about it. Like there are a lot of things that just aren't me. Uh, but sometimes you you look at the options and say, you know, like I'm I'm down 50 pounds from two years ago, and I I'm happy that I am a person who is. It's not a, a weight thing. It's not a vanity thing. It's not that. Now I can say I am a person who can go outside and do hard work all day long. Three years ago. I could not say that about myself. If I said, if what I, if what I do is who I am, then I cannot go out and cut wood all day. I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be somebody where I can go out and cut wood all day. So I really slowly, without any big changes to my life, I just simply ate a little better and and started to move around a bit and just let time kick in. Uh, I got to a point where I feel good about what I'm doing because it's a reflection of who I am. And I feel good about who I am because of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's a really good cyclical thing there. Uh, So it can work in big ways. It can work in the little brushing your teeth ways, uh, but it's a really good way to combat short-term depression, to to navigate more so than combat. Because I'm not suggesting that it solves any of those problems. It doesn't. We we know that it's much, much more complex than a, a little hack like this, right? But it can help you navigate being in a bad place. Uh, when I when I alluded to ha- being in a tough spot in the last couple of weeks, it's like, okay, am I somebody who gets my work done despite being in difficult circumstances? Or am I somebody who just devotes all my time and energy right now into the, the problem, into, into 
not really being victimized by a problem, but like being enveloped by a problem. Like, no, I need to deal with the problem the best I can, and I need to keep my life together. That's what I did because that's who I am. It wasn't natural. It wasn't natural at all. The instant reaction is like, oh, life is terrible right now. I would like to devote everything to that terrible situation, and I want to feel bad about it. You know, I want to have the grief that I honestly should have here. It's like, no, 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 that. That isn't who I am when I think about me. Uh, so what do I have to do to be who I am? And it was, all right, you, you give this an appropriate amount of grief and stress and attention. You do take care of the basic responsibilities. You ask for help to get those things done when you need to. You know, that's another thing that's not natural to me is, is asking for help. But it really all worked out okay because... I took today's rule of what you do is who you are and then figured out the steps I needed to take to do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you also want to be the, that person. You want to be, uh, I mean, I think that most people would like to see themselves as that person, but you do have to do do the things. You, you can't just talk about it. You can't just think about it. You can't, like you said, you can't just dream about it. I mean, everybody who anyone admires they don't admire them for sitting around and dreaming of things <laughs> like that's not a thing because you can't, no. you can't be in somebody's head. You can't be, wow. You know what? Like John Willoughby had the dopest dreams. If it, <laughs> in 1952, <laughs> like he was the best dreamer. It's like, well, yeah, he, no. had, he had the best ambitions of, of anybody in 1952. It, well, if he did, the follow up question is like, oh, so what happened? <laughs> Yeah, nothing. It's like nothing. Oh, he was really ambitious. Like no, he um no, he was really excited when when his TV started to get a third channel instead of two, and so you know, yeah. he just kind of watched it for thirty years. Um, I do want to put this in one more context because I think it's really important. Uh, you and I and literally everybody are perpetually writing their own obituaries. Okay, and that sounds weird and morbid, uh, but it's but it's true. It's true. I bet very few people listening have ever written an obituary. Um, I've written a few of them. I I like it. And you can tell because it, it, the intros that we do to this podcast are very obituary-esque in that they talk about what a person has has done and who they are. And we have the luxury of talking about where they're going, whereas in an obituary, you don't. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, you you can get a sense from those intros that you know th that I like to think about obituaries. There are some that I'm writing for terminally ill people who I know are going to need them in coming years, and I, I think about them frequently. I have uh, a page on the Notes app on my iPhone where there every once in a while I'll be doing something and I'll think about a line that I, I know that I would like to say uh, about somebody when the time comes, and I'll put that in. So I'm. I'm kind of constantly working on obituaries of one kind or another, but you truly are writing your own every day. If you had to write one for yourself right now, you have to talk about the things you did, maybe the things you liked to, and that's fine, that's valid, but no obituary contains things about your judgments or the things you believe or the dreams you had. They just kind of don't. You know, they'll say that somebody is a cat lover. They won't say uh, that somebody died hating dogs. <laughs> like, no, that's not how any of this works. No, they talk about the thing that you did do and that you did like. So, yeah, he's a cat lover. He's he's not a dog hater unless you've done things in your life that that really holds you up to be like the Hitler of dogs. Then then maybe you're getting dog hating in your obituary. <laughs> Uh, but, Corella Deville's but generally Corella no. Deville's obituary. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yes, she's getting it in but there. But that's because she did something. Is. She wanted to make a coat out of she puppies. She did something. She didn't just talk she about it. She did something. She wanted to make a puppy coat. That's right. That's right. Uh, the, you do bring up something else too that the bad things that you do are also who you are. Uh, and when people say that like mistakes don't define you and things like well, not 100%, but they're absolutely a part of who you are. 
Uh, they always will be. Um, you have to own that. Uh, but that's that actually goes into another rule for another time. But think about what you would put in your own obituary. If it's who did I use when I did that example? Uh, Pebbles, Glozell, and Schlatt. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of their obituaries are going to have any statistics in them. If they do, it's going to be so general, it, something that will express that they made millions of people happy. Right. But there aren't going to be any statistics. Nobody in, like, when YouTubers die, it's not going to be like, he had a channel with 700,000 views. Like, no, it'll say things like, he explained technology to everybody in a way that they understood. Because what matters is what that person is doing. It's not, it's not their watch time and it's not their click-through rate. It's just not, you know? And I think about the people in, in the Discord, for example, who have channels that are uh, on the newer side, they're building up. It doesn't matter that they have 150 subs because the part that matters is what they're doing, which is making whatever content and they're doing it on time. Um, NRM with the bear bite stuff. I said to him the other day, like you're doing this regularly. He's working on a two hour video. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a big one, uh, gearing up, I think for a February release, but all through this year, he has planned his content and executed his content with a team of people. That is hard to do. That is really hard to do. The fact that the videos uh, aren't getting a million views is completely irrelevant to me. That's not who he is. He is somebody who makes videos on a schedule. He does what he s- says he's going to do, and uh, he makes he makes people happy. Does it matter if it's a hundred people or a hundred million? No, that's that's irrelevant, and that part's not going in his obituary. Well, especially if in I'm a historical context, like we have such a warped sense of of that now, which is so ridiculous. The, what I mean, like the scale, the scale thing, like think of, mm, think of how many yeah. people it was amazing for you to have touched their lives for most of humanity. It was like a Dunbar number. It was like, and, and probably you, you oh, yeah. not have not Double all, digits. not all of them liked you. So <laughs> let's say that you live no, with 150 no. people and, you know, maybe like 30 of them liked you a whole bunch. You just lived an amazing life because 30 people <sighs> liked you. You didn't even know anything about about the world, to be honest, back in the day and not even that long ago. So um, <laughs> this, I don't know why this popped into my head, uh, but there, there are two card sets that I really like from uh, the teens and 20s, give or take. Uh, and one of them is called National Types of Beauty. And I think it's 50 cards and each woman uh, on a card is some nationality. You know, there's... Uh, uh, a Russian and a Turk and an uh, Irish woman and like 50 nations, 50 beautiful women, one on each card. That set mattered to people because you were never going to see more than like two of those types of beauty in person in your life. <laughs> There's even if you're in a city, you're not seeing 50 of them. You could be in the most bustling city in the world. You could be in London uh, in 1920 and probably see like 12 of these global types of beauty in a lifetime. Uh, now I can scroll, you know, my, my wheel on my mouse on Twitter and get like 12 different ethnicities of women with only fans for $3. I can see a lot more than their, their face. It's completely different. The scale is totally different. The other set uh, that's very much like this is children of the world. Uh, and that's one that I have. I, I don't actually own the National Types of Beauty set. I haven't found it for the right price yet. But I do have the children one. And it's uh, kids in like traditional dress of that country in the right around 1900. Um, uh, you need to see that because there's just no exposure at all. None. None. And it's the same with with making people happy. It's, it's the same with making people mad. There's a reason why uh, Jesse James and... Uh, Bonnie and Clyde and all of these outlaw types gain notoriety because they made a lot of people mad or killed them or robbed them or whatever it was in a lot of different places. You know how hard that was to do a hundred years ago? You were just an asshole in your own town. (laughs) It's true though. Yeah, I know. you, You couldn't even piss people off in several counties, let alone like five states. And if you did that, it was worth writing about in the newspaper. And making movies about a hundred years later. Yeah. Yeah. And now you can make a very offensive tweet and 
by the time, you know, like like that woman who made an offensive uh, tweet about Africa, she did it right as she as the plane took off. And by the time she'd landed, the whole world knew who she was, what she'd said. She'd lost her job and her life was destroyed. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. <laughs> that's, that's, and that was like 10 years ago. And now I still remember it and I'm still talking about her. I don't I don't remember her name, but yeah. everybody knows the story. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, the scale is bonkers absolutely bonkers and the grander that scale the less the measurements of it matter so nobody cares about the views nobody cares about the time it doesn't matter if anybody even likes the thing what matters is that you do it and if you do it then when somebody else writes your obituary they can say that you were a poet they can say that you made some short films they can say that you amassed a, a beanie baby collection that that's the greatest of Rhode Island. I don't know, <laughs> but it'll be something that you've actually done. So if you think is what I'm engaged in, if what I'm doing with my life, is that going to show up in my obituary? If the answer is no, then you really need to think about, about doing things a little bit differently or accept that what you're doing is what you want to do. And that's what makes you happy. And again, that is totally and completely fine, but you've, you, you've just got to be honest with yourself about all those things. Uh, yeah. So going back to that, the rule itself being you are what you do. Uh, it's very short. It's very simple. It is very, very, very complex when you begin to apply it to every little thing, every little thing in your life. Yeah. And I, I like applying it to, to very simple things. Like you said, like brushing your teeth, folding your laundry, mm -hmm. picking up after yourself, <laughs> like just start with a simple thing. Like, are you a person who does that? If not, then are you okay with that? Would you like to be? Well, right. You get a sense for which one you want more or which one you want less. Uh, and it, I did this myself on Monday because the garbage man comes on Monday. I, oh God, uh, Sunday and Monday, I was physically destroyed. I really felt terrible physically. Uh, and yeah, I'm up at like 8.30, uh, got to have the garbage out by 9.30 or so. I did not want to get up and go outside. There was snow on the ground for the first time. Oh, I hated it. And I thought, do I want to be somebody who takes the garbage out right now and does that reliably every Monday? Or do I want to be somebody who has, uh, who waits until next week and has five bags of trash in their back foyer? I did not want to take the garbage out. And to be honest, I'm not going to win any like public reputation for dealing with my own garbage. Nobody's going to know about this. Uh, but I really didn't want to have five bags of festering shit garbage in my back foyer for an additional seven days. <laughs> yeah. So between those two options, one of them I liked a lot less than the other one. I'm like, well, these are the only two options. It's going to play out one way here or the other. And I really don't want to have that garbage sticking around for a week. So I will do the thing I don't want to do, which is go and take the garbage out. Uh, I didn't sit there for five minutes deliberating it the way I'm explaining it right now. You know, it, it's one of those things that kind of happens instantly in your head, but I'm expanding on what that process was. That's the process. It's exactly the same. It's like, well, we can do this or we can do that. Is there one that I really want to do or is there one that I really want to avoid? If so, that dictates my path. Makes it a lot easier to do a lot of the things that you don't want to do and avoid a lot of problems. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which 
has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler packs. You'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. That, that springs two things to mind for me. One is that so often, and I know that everyone listening to this can relate because this is just how it works. Uh, you know, you see kind of viral tweets about this all the time. And that is that so often the thing that you just don't want to do, you, you're wasting more time mm. complaining in your head about the thing that you don't want to do than it takes you yep. to just do the thing and get it over with. I don't know why yes. we do that as humans. We're so dumb when it comes to this, but it's like you could spend all day mad that you have to wash the dishes or take out the garbage, or you could mm -hmm. just do those things. And it literally takes like five minutes. It's not like this horrendous undertaking. It's like, man, <laughs> usually not. No, yeah. like rarely, like uh, unless you put it off, like you said, for a really, really long time. And then it is a really big undertaking that you need to like, you know, dedicate an hour to for the most part, man, it's like the things that we, you know, really like opine over having to do to just freaking take five minutes and just do it. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore rather than being mad about it for an hour. It's like, just do it. <laughs> and it's done. It is crazy. It's so stupid. It is crazy how, yeah. So like, it, you know, I told you that I it's thought like of an this. inverse no, relationship was... between like complaining and, <laughs> and accomplishing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot that goes along uh, with, with this mindset. Um, and last night I was sending you, Kevin, pictures of, of this, this thing I was oiling and I did not want to put a coat on because it takes about half an hour. Uh, I didn't want to be on my feet for half an hour in the basement. I, you know, again, felt like trash last night. Um, and I kept thinking of it. It sounds like, so oh, creepy when, I when you say done. I sent you pictures of the thing I was oiling last night. Like that sounds, <laughs> that sounds so weird. Like you said, it's so matter of factly and nobody knows what yeah. you're talking about. It sounds creepy. Oh, that was before we started recording, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was putting a tongue oil finish on T U N G, which is not. It has nothing to do with the tongue in anybody's mouth. Uh, this oil on some wood, um, and I sent uh, before and after picture to Kevin on it. Uh, but the reason I went down and did it at like quarter to ten is because I kept thinking when I'm done doing this coat of oil, I need to look. Uh, I, I need to get some more brushes. So it's something that I, I don't have enough of right now. I, I just need an array of brushes appropriate for oils. I kept thinking like this popped into my head like every 20 minutes where I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to look for brushes after I do this. Round. Well, after like the fourth time of thinking of it, I thought, no, I need to stop having this pop into my head. I, like I need to do this thing so that it doesn't pop into my head anymore. It just needs to be gone. So I went and did it. And I, that was it. I took care of the problem. It wasn't dogging me, but at the same time, it shouldn't exist to jump in my mind three times an hour until it's done. Like, no, I'm going to pop that bubble and, and get on with life. Yeah, I have that same. I think this is like a personality problem. I have that same exact thing where it's like something will just itch at me until I do it. And then when I do it, the, 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 uh, you know. It's the itch has been scratched. It's relieved. And I, and I, and I move on. There was a second yeah. thing that popped in, that sprung into my head. You know, I was going to mention earlier. Um, and that is as it relates to, you know, your garbage situation is so, mm -hmm. so often if you do wait, the problem gets worse. Like the, so if you had wait, almost always. Yeah. Like if you had waited, yeah. uh, if you had blown off taking the garbage out that week, well, great. Now you just literally made a worse problem for yourself. Now you have stinky garbage in your foyer or whatever for a full week. Now you have to take out twice as much garbage next week. And this is a metaphor, folks. 
<laughs> for a while, mm -hmm. a lot of things that play into this idea of you are what you do. And it's like, if you're not doing the thing today, chances are it's the problem still going <sighs> to exist. And now it's worse. There, there are very few problems that get better when you just ignore them. <laughs> like at the least, it will be just as much of a problem later at on. At the least. Yeah. But at the, the best case scenario here is uh, you kick the can down the road and it's the same exact can. Usually, though, it's it's sort of like interest on a debt. <laughs> and it may be uh, massively different. Uh, it may have doubled or it may have just ticked up. The can you know, is, by 5%. is bigger, heavier, full of maggots. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. Eventually, it's like a 55-gallon barrel filled with <laughs> molten lead. Uh, I, I want to cap this with with what I would consider like the next level element of it. Because there is, I think there's a higher level once you you kind of master that, the basics of of thinking about things like this. And uh, Kevin, I mentioned to you earlier today that I was, uh, I was reading a book uh, about collapse of the Soviet Union and something popped in my head related to this topic. Uh, so <clears throat> You need a little bit of background on this, but not much. Uh, Yuri Andropov was the leader of, of uh, uh, he was general secretary of the Communist Party in 1982. He was the handpicked successor of Brezhnev. Uh, in the 25 years before he led the party, he ran the KGB. So from 67 to 82, uh, Yuri Andropov was the head of, of the KGB during the absolute height of the Cold War. He had an interview with somebody, a job interview. Somebody came in uh, and the guy started off by saying, well, let me tell you about myself. And this sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke at all. Uh, and Dropov stopped him and said, what makes you think that what makes you think that you know more about you than we do? And that's obviously very creepy in the KGB sense. Mm -hmm. It's like a chilling, weird as hell, uh, you know, creep thing. But think about what the KGB is doing here. They are monitoring what somebody does day after day after day in every element of their life that is real. They are seeing who you talk to, what you say to, uh, to those people. They're seeing what books you read. They're uh, listening into your phone conversations. They're seeing who your friends are. They're seeing where you go and hang out and drink. Uh, they're seeing what happens when you drink, what kind of clothes you wear, what you eat, all of these things, what you eat, literally everything, all of the things that you do. Now, somebody would say, you can't watch me. You can't do this Truman Showish thing and know who I am because you don't know what I believe. You don't know what I think about anything. Uh, you don't know any of my preferences. And that's true. Uh, but you can know a whole lot about somebody from just seeing what they do and don't do. Sometimes you can have a better understanding because everything you're looking at is objective and clear, a better understanding than they themselves do of who they are. It's really hard to know who you are. Like, Kevin, if I asked you to write a single page about who you are, that would take you to get it right, to have it be accurate in your eyes. It would it would take you days. You would want to have many drafts of that to make sure that you had all the important things in. Uh, and it was, it was totally accurate. If I had to write a one pager about who you are, it's going to take me like 20 minutes <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I, it's a benefit not to be in your head in that scenario. I'm just looking at straight up realities. Uh, but what you wrote would be wanted, better. It would be a better, uh, you would paint a better picture for other people to get an understanding of who I am. Then it I would, would probably be more accurate. Then I would yeah. be able to do a, a self-portrait to continue the probably. analogy. Probably. And even if if you did a really good job and you tried to be as accurate as possible, we were also talking today about self-reporting on uh, like social science studies, things like that. People are wrong about all sorts of things involving themselves. They don't mean to be. They're not trying to mislead you. They're just completely and totally wrong. There are all sorts of paradoxes uh, on on the education side when it comes to people in action. One of these is that routinely, now not so much this year, but like over the last 30 years, if there's a broad public survey done about the most important issues uh, 
in in like midterm elections or presidential election or something like that, people will say education being like number two. Economy is usually number one, but they they rank education very, very highly. Then they don't factor that in at all when they vote. In terms of how they make decisions on voting, it comes in like ninth. So they want to be somebody who values education, but then they do a thing that does not prioritize education. Uh, That's super weird. People also think that in the United States, schools are badly broken. However, they think their local school is pretty good. Mm. This is a really strange phenomenon where it's like, yeah, my neighborhood's all right. It's pretty good. But no, no, it's it's the rest of the world that is failing badly. Well, that can't be true everywhere. (laughs) You know, like (laughs) it's like somebody's wrong here Uh, and they're not being cruel to other people. They're not even trying to lie about their own neighborhoods. They truly believe this. So you you don't get reliable data about like the state of education by asking these people their own opinions. Uh, that's really complex. And it's the same when people think about themselves and describe themselves. It's hard to sort out. It's really hard to know who you are. And this is why it's hard when you're a teen. You know, people are like, oh, it's figuring themselves out. Or, you know, you get your first job after high school or you go to college, you do stuff. And it's it's like, oh, they've got to find out who they are. That is the hardest thing in all of humanity is to come up with with a good summary of who you especially are. Now. Especially now. Especially now. I think it was now. not that hard back in the day when you're like, my father's a blacksmith, so I will be a blacksmith yeah. and my son will that's be right. a blacksmith. It's like, all right, that's that's pretty that's a pretty solid uh, trajectory there for you and your life and your the lives <laughs> the lives of your offspring. But but now now it's like, <laughs> hey, you can be anything you want to be. And everyone's like, I don't know what anything. that is. It's like, good luck. Bye. <laughs> anything. It's so brutally difficult. And I think that's why we see uh, we see rises in things that we've, we've never seen before, which is like, you know, we've we have people who are uh, into the furry community who are part of, you know, part of the, the TCU thing. People didn't pretend to be animals two, 200 years ago very much. Not very often. Uh, now they're more prone to that. Uh, people didn't identify uh, as having any sort of complexity with, with sexuality, even in like the baby boomer generation, like one or 2% did then. Now it's like 20% because everything is a lot more complex and people are navigating a more complex world uh, and, and like putting their preferences into uh, finer categories than we've ever had before, you know? So literally everything is more complex. If even with cars, like Kevin, you must remember as a kid, when people talked about cars, like, like I've got this, whatever. One of the first questions is somebody asking if you drove standard or automatic, Mm -hmm. like that, that was more important than, than some specific model of your car. It's like, Oh no, is that a standard or an automatic transmission? Uh, now, that question is is almost entirely gone. Very few people drive a standard, and uh, that's relegated to you know a specific class of cars, really. Uh, but now you've got to say like, yeah, well, I went with the uh, uh, you know CVX over the whatever because of like this detail and that detail and whatever. Before it's like, yeah, I needed to fit five people and drive standard. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. Yeah, uh, just people would just identify cars as brands. I, I, I'm a Chevy. Yeah. I'm a Chevy man. A, That's it. I drive a Ford. Yeah, I drive a yeah. Ford. That was it. Yeah, I don't walk around pounding my chest because I drive a Subaru. I that's that's not part of the world right now. Uh, not in the same way. But yeah, everything is more complex. It is really hard to sort that out in your own head. I don't even know how I do it about myself. I have no clue who I am. Uh, not in a useful way to communicate that to anybody else. I can talk about the things I do, though, and they can get a really good picture of what my life is about, what matters to me, what my values are. They can get all of the important information when I talk about the things I do. That's it. Well, and that's kind of that's kind of changed is. for you. Uh, and I don't think that you articulate. Maybe this is an example of <laughs> you being inside your own head and, and me on the outside observing you. And, you know, holding up the mirror, but you didn't even do a good job in this podcast articulating the types of things you started doing again recently, which is really important, I think, to this conversation, whether it's 
you know, oh. oiling the wood or like grinding your meat jerky and dehydrating meats and all of this stuff. Like in the past year, two years, whatever, you have reki yeah, rekindled like a lot of hobbies that you had sort of abandoned like a decade and a half ago that I think yeah. have sprung forth this rule in a lot of ways for you because now you have a better grasp at who you are because of all the things that you're doing now. Whereas before it's like, who am, who are you? Uh, I'm a guy who reads a lot of books and reads a lot of internet articles. Like that's, I don't know. That's a weird thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was doing a lot of things that were hard to communicate the, the doing the, uh, like communicating the value of them was, was really difficult. You know, like I spent a lot of years in a lot of different countries and if somebody asked why, I mean, like, I, I would kind of figure it out when I got there. You know, I was talking to the baby gang about a week ago where um, I made several decisions based on the website pintprice.org. This is a database that tracks the, the price of a pint of beer worldwide uh, by country and then by cities within that country. You can get a great picture of the cost of living in a city or in a country by seeing the price of beer. Um, the price of cheese is a good indicator as well. Uh, milk and cheese. Um, so I would, yeah, there were times where it's, I, I'd come up with a list of like five places on pint price and it's not like I wanted to go there and drink. That wasn't the point. This was an index that was useful to me about what I was going to be able to afford. And that, I, I liked that process. And then I would figure out what I was going to do when I got there. And that was cool, but there's not a clean way to communicate that value to other people the way now it's like, well, I've got a lot of stones spread out in a lot of places. I'm moving that stone so that I can build a stone wall in front of my house. Everything about that is clear. I guess the only question you could ask is like, well, how high is it going to be? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, most of the information is in that little bit that I told you, whereas before it was this muddy, you know, nothingness kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of clarity uh, that comes through. And it was as simple as do I want to do, you know, X or do I want to do Y? Well, I want to do a lot of Y. And if I'm going to do that, I need to set up a proper workshop. So I did. It took me a while. It's still going, but the basics are there. I need to be able to see. Uh, well, okay. I, I need uh, to sort out a lighting problem. Um, I need more space. Well, I have to optimize and organize and deal with some things that I put off for a really long time. It, it was all this choice where, uh, this series of choices where it's like, who am I? What am I doing to reflect that? And it, most of the time you have to do a few things to allow for the choice that you're making. And it's a long, long process when you've put it off for six or seven years. But now I can do a lot of the projects that matter to me. Um, well, Andy asked what stone I use. Uh, mostly, it, well, it's, it's almost all shale. Uh, so it cleaves nicely. Uh, but it's been the foundations of failed buildings over the years. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. All right. Your shale aside, the other thing that you didn't mention that you've mentioned to me before is that you've also gotten comfortable being patient with all of these processes yeah. taking a long time and sort of building slowly yeah. rather than being because this is a, this is an important point to make is that I think that a lot of people get overwhelmed by mm -hmm. everything that they want to do. It's way too much to do at once. So then they don't do anything because. They want to do yes. the whole thing and they want to do it right now. And it's impossible 
So they give up yeah. and don't do they it. They want the results. Too. They don't do any of it. They want to do it and, yeah. and get the payoff. Yeah. Too. It's yeah. like, okay, I know we say this phrase a lot on this podcast, but again, it doesn't work like that way. It does not work that way. The way that it works is being comfortable with iteration, with being comfortable with compound interest and just trusting yeah. the process that you do in order to set up a workshop, you got to clean up that room and that's going to take a week or more and figure out where all that stuff right. goes. You have to decide upon the lighting. That's going to take another week, blah, 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 blah. Months and months and months and months go by, but you're still chipping away at this thing, knowing and trusting that eventually it will get to a place where you're happy with it. I do think that's a lot easier uh, just being older. I think that perspective develops naturally and I don't quite know... Mm -hmm how to foster it. I don't know what would have worked. You know, like we talked a couple of weeks ago, what would work on, on a younger version of me? What would have convinced us to, to think this way 20 years ago? Sometimes I, I think there's nothing that, that'll do that. Um, I, one of the most useful things that I, I got was through bowling, uh, which sounds goofy as hell, but think about this. The goal of every single frame in bowling is to get a strike. If you don't get a strike, you want to get as many pins on the spare as possible. You want to get the spare if you can, but if not, as many pins. That's it. That's the game of bowling. And this happens over and over and over again. A perfect game is 12 strikes in a row. This is a, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, meme-ish, but like which strike out of those 12 is the most important? Not none of them. They they all have to happen to roll a perfect game. And the goal on every single frame is to roll a strike. So it never matters if you're in the 10th frame or the fourth frame or whatever. No, you, you, you realize that every time you go bowling, you get the ball and try to either roll the best ball you can to get a strike or pick up the spare. That's it. The only thing that matters is what's happening on that actual shot. And if you do a really good job that day, they will add up and you'll have high scores across a game. But all of it is broken down into this component of you have to make this shot. That's it. There is not a single shot that matters more than another one. Now, at the very highest levels where you're tracking how the oil is moving down the lane across a match and at the level beyond that where you're trying to move oil into or away from your opponent's pattern, this is a different thing. Like at that point, we're talking like really, really a high level bowling, <laughs> uh, you know, like a hundred people in the world are, are truly able to, uh, to deal with it on that level. Um, but everybody else, man, it's, it's that shot. And then it's onto the next one. You know, you make a video, you make it good. Uh, you put that out, it's onto the next one. Nothing matters more than the video you're making right now. And nothing matters less than the one that you just made. <laughs> it's, it's the weirdest paradox where it's everything right now. As soon as it's done, it's kind of nothing. And then the next thing is everything. And you just do this over and over again. If your job sucks, if you're pushing a pencil, if you are uh, frying wings like you did, Kevin, nothing matters more than the batch of wings that's in front of you. Perfect it. And you want to be somebody who, who does the job well. The fact that it's, it's not fulfilling your ultimate goals in life, totally irrelevant. You kick the ass in, you kick the ass in that moment, you do your thing, you do it in the next moment, you go home and, uh, you know, you made videos and 10 years later it works out, but it's all this series of micro little tiny moments where you're taking the garbage out, you're brushing your teeth, you're showing up on time, you're getting your work done. You're doing all the things that you told somebody you were going to do and you tried to do them to the best of your ability. Uh, you did the things that make you a good friend, a good son, a good boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, a good mom. I, it, it doesn't matter. All of these are little junctures where it's like, well, who am I? If who I am is what I'm doing, then what do I do right now to be that person? That's it. That's the rule. And the insight is that each day is a frame of bowling in the game of <laughs> Trying to get a perfect yes. score. So each day, try to throw a strike. And if you don't. If you don't, that's all right. Try yeah. to pick up the spare tomorrow. <laughs> you pick up the spare. That's right. And then the next the next ball is another opportunity to throw a strike. Yeah. Like it, it's the same thing over and over. And you can embrace that rather than being crushed by the monotony of it. There's no monotony at all. I have, I have not thrown, I don't know how many total 
uh, balls I've thrown in, in my life with bowling. But let me tell you, it's a lot. I was bowling 60, 70 games a week for a while. I've never thrown two shots that were the same. No, no baseball pitcher has ever thrown two pitches that were the same. Uh, Kevin, you, you have never delivered, uh, two takes recording anything that were exactly the same. Dude, you can't even write your signature twice the same. Didn't you watch that video? That's right. <laughs> I, I didn't watch it. I don't, don't watch, I don't watch it. No, 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 no. I don't watch, I don't watch channels like Vsauce too. No, I don't blame you. No. Yeah. Try to. Oh, you're right. You can't even, if you can't try. even write your name twice the same. Impossible. So embrace that. Love it. Uh, make it who you are and you're just going to be happy. You're going to be happy and confident and the things that should bother you become mild annoyances. They aren't life ruining problems. They aren't life defining problems. You know how to navigate them because you know who you are and you just, you just get on with it and have a little more time and energy for the things that you really want to do. Yeah. I like it. We've got two, we got two questions before we go. I think they're both quick. Okay, cool. Uh, this one's from Dan the Latch. Have you ever done something that you felt was right, even though you knew it would make your life harder? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah, uh, that is a tough question. I will say that people act against their own self-interest all the time, uh, constantly, because, yeah, they, they value something else. I mean, um, if you think about like going back to a political thing. Uh, voting to have somebody else use your ma- your money is against your self interest in the sense that you lose the ability to allocate it the way you want. Um, it would be better if you just decided like who needed your money and then you gave it to them uh, instead of paying a lot of taxes and then having other people decide. Yet nobody votes for those candidates who want to eliminate taxes. I mean, a handful of people do, but but. That's us not going to get anybody elected in 2022, right? So everybody's stepping in. 98% of people are stepping into the voting booth and voting against their own self-interest. And they're happy to do it. They're fine with it. They value other things more. Uh, it's absolutely making their life harder. So I, I, that's not a specific answer that I think Dan was probably looking for. Do you have a specific, Kevin? No, I don't. Only because I don't do that sort of self-reflecting. I, I just don't. Like, I don't. This is going to sound weird. I kind of don't. But I don't think about the past almost ever. Like I barely remember anything about my life. This is like a strange thing to admit. But in order to remember things about your life, like you have to, there there are like two ways in which memories stick. One is that it was uh, something occurred that sort of created a paradigm shift, like something unexpected essentially occurred that created like a, a poignant paradigm shift in your life. That you, you, you can't forget, like you couldn't forget if you tried because it just altered the way that you think at that, that time and place. Um, and the other way you remember things is if you think about them a lot and you dwell on them and you, you know, bring them yeah. back into your memory uh, often enough that they don't go away. I don't really do that. So I don't know. I just move on. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sure that there are a million times that I made Me a decision that I thought was right that made my life harder for sure. Uh, I I have moved way too many times. I'll say that <laughs> I should not have moved uh, a yeah. million times. That made my life yeah. way harder and uh, cost me a lot of money. I should not have done that. Yeah. I've got a lot of those types of things that I knew at the time were going to be one step back, which I did to take two steps forward after, you know, there's all sorts of, all sorts of those, whether it's moving or doing something a little different with work or uh, something with relationships, whatever. Sometimes you just have to do things that make your life hard. It's necessary so that it's not hard in the future. Um, Ducky's question is is what I want to end on here. Uh, you mentioned being stuck in your head at a certain point isn't healthy, but how do you know if a decision is correct if it's all that complex? Uh, Kevin, do you want to go first or do you want me to ramble my answer? I would like you to ramble your answer. Okay. I, I don't care. I don't, I don't think you can usually know if it's, if decisions are correct. I think it usually takes a really long time. Uh, and even when they're wrong, that can lead to, that can lead to things that, uh, you would otherwise ne- never do that are amazing. Um, I don't think about it because I, I don't think there it's clean, like dominoes falling. Uh, sometimes something can appear to be amazing a year down the road and totally ruinous 10, 10 years down the road. So what's the point of 
of evaluating whether something was a good decision when you can't even know if it's good or measuring the acceleration of that decision at that moment in time is ultimately misleading. Uh, so I feel like you do the best you can. You constantly reevaluate and adjust rather than 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 trying to make the correct decision so much. You do the best you can and then you evolve with the consequences of that decision. If it was a bad one, you you make other decisions that correct for it. If it was a good one, you do more of it. Uh, but you're constantly checking in almost like your hands are on a steering wheel uh, and you're making the little corrections to keep yourself on the road. I think that's the best you can do. I don't, I don't really know. But w- what I do know is that when you live in your own head, when you've got a problem, that means your entire world has a problem. <laughs> like by definition, when you have some issue that's consuming you globally, since it's occurring in your cranium, there is a global tragedy and a global disaster. That's real bad. That makes every facet of your life suck bad. Uh, you've got to get out of your own head. That's why I love this podcast and I love the community of people who make stuff because doing anything, doing anything creative is projecting something out of somebody's head. And I love seeing it. I love the fact that they've released the thing. They've let other people into their own head. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, but that's an example of of getting out of your own head. Um, yeah, otherwise you sit there and stew and you're uh, somebody from Kevin's rule who gets real pissed off at everything and probably doesn't even understand it. <laughs> it's not any good. No. no, no, it's definitely not good. And and some some things I would say on this topic are really not that complex. Like, like the, like the garbage example, like that's not complicated. Yeah. It's like, do I take this no. out now or not? It's really a, a simple dilemma. And then and I know that was the right decision. And, I don't have to wonder 20 years down the road, whether it was right. No, that one was right. And you can know right away that if you don't do the thing, it's going to make your life worse in a week. So it's like, do I want, yeah. do I want to make my life worse like seven days from now? Or do I want to make yeah. my life you know, normal settled set have have the, the the normal level of problem that I'm choosing not to deal with now. It's like at least a normal smell in my back room. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. Um. Okay, I think we're good. I think we're good. You are what you do. Remember that. Write it down. You are what you do. That's uh. It's etched. Uh. It's such a cleaner observation and and life rule than mine. I, I need to make mine as clean as yours. Someday I could get there. I don't know. But um, I like it. It's good. And um, there will be more of this. I hope that you've enjoyed this discussion. I'm really liking these discussions. I find them interesting. This is really more of a glimpse into the stuff that Matt and I talk about privately, more so than the stuff that we talk about when we have guests on the podcast. So, And it puts both together too. In in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, you know, it, it it combines the guests, it combines us with the stuff that literally all of us are doing, that you're doing, that we're doing. Uh, it, it matters to everything and everybody. Yeah, and I I thought of a it, it, that. See, this is the other thing, real quick, about doing things is like you don't know what it will it will lead to if you do if you actually do a thing rather than just talk about it. So by doing this podcast, I thought of a new rule and I wrote it down. And perhaps that will be You got your next rule already. Yeah, I thought of one and I was like, I'm going to interject with this. And then I decided, no, 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 no. I'm not going to spoil it now. I'm not going to interject. I'm going to write it down and we're going to do a whole episode just about this one idea uh, because I think it's important enough to flesh out on its own. So you all excited. You all can look forward to that. Um, All right. Uh, Thanks to all our patrons for hanging out with us. Uh, If you want to become a patron and support the show, go to patreon.com slash the create unknown, become a $2 tot. We would love to have you, but we're out of here for now. Thanks everyone for hanging out on discord. We'll see you space cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. 
Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente de los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Rise Bread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Chelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71. 